know. Let's get this party started. We have quorum, so I've been counting as we came in. Um, do you want to send out the attendance? Excellent. Uh, reminder that you cannot say you're in attendance if you aren't physically in the same room I'm in, right? So you need to be in B207 at North Campus to actually have your attendance count. So virtual or down the hall, et cetera, is not, uh, doesn't count. So anyway, welcome to March. It's uh, like my favorite time of the year, other than of course, uh, daylight savings and losing an hour. So I'm not quite sure who decided we should lose an hour at two in the morning on a Saturday versus maybe four in the afternoon on a, a Monday. That'd be better, I think. But I don't get to make those rules. But it's sunny today. And as I promised at the last meeting, the sun is now setting later. And the sun is going to set after 7 p.m. every day until the end of October now. So we made it. That's very exciting. Um, we also, uh, March is just fantastic for many reasons. We had uh, International Women's Day was Friday the 8th. Uh, we just started Ramadan, which is um, the holiest month for our Muslim students and faculty and staff. So just as a reminder with that, in uh, Islam, our students and faculty and staff do um, fast during the day from dawn until dusk. So you may have students that are you know, hungry or a little cranky, things like that, because they are fasting. So please keep that in mind for our students um, of Muslim faith. Um, my very favorite day is in two days. It is Pi Day, 3.14 for all you uh, non-math people. It has to do with geometry, not statistics, but I did do um, a probability with 0.314 for my students the other day for class. So. Um, we have the Ides of March, so those of us that do Latin and history and all that is Friday the 15th, St. Patrick's Day, of course, the 17th, and then for our Italian Americans, we have the St. Joseph's uh, Feast, which is the 19th, um, and then for all other things, the spring equinox on the 19th, and then we have spring break. Hallelujah, at the end of the month, right? So on the 29th. So March is um, fantastic. It's a rebirth for me. Uh, it's midterms this week. We're midway through the semester. You know, it's getting better and brighter outside. We are almost, you know, through the semester, but the spring is here. I have crocuses blooming, which I'm super excited did not get ruined by the um, snowstorm. That didn't happen, but uh, they're still looking nice and purple and purdy, uh, perk, perky this morning as I left. So um, I was going to announce the new deans today, uh, but they uh, are not here yet, so I'm going to hold off on that. Uh, but we have two new deans for liberal arts. We have Adam Patterson, who's uh, in charge of English, humanities, communication arts. And then we have Catherine Aiken, who is STEM. Uh, so if they come in, I'll introduce someone's pointing. No, that's Jason Perry. He is a dean. He is a dean, but he is a dean of students. Jason, welcome. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, one of the things later on the agenda I'm taking off, Dan Frontera is unable to be here today, but there is a RSVP link that uh, was emailed out. I'm going to also include it in the College Senate update I send later in the week, but there is a Microsoft Forms, real nice and easy. Um, your name, your email address, your phone number, faculty or staff for volunteering for commencement. So uh, if that is for walking, that is for uh, all of the things, so fill that out and then you will be put on an email list for more information. Um, I'm super excited about this form because it doesn't ask me how much I weigh this year because that's what they usually do for the gowns. Which, um, if that does come out, I always lie and say I weigh 100 pounds because, you know, because I do mentally. Um, and it, my gown always fits. So 
uh, just a little uh, side note about uh, that. So that came out, if you're going to participate, which again is my favorite time of, favorite day of the year. This is my favorite time of the year, but it's my favorite day of the year uh, just to see our students and their families and all the great things that they accomplish. So that's the form. Fill it out. Hope to see you there. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over. Uh, Dr. Sagai was unable to be here today, so AVP uh, Adrian Rannick is going to give her report instead. Adrian. Thank you, Dr. Quinn. Dr. Sagai would like me to reinforce the fact that for the eclipse on April 8th, the college is gonna be closed. You should have received a communication today from marketing, and I believe previously if communication went out, or I'm, I got that backwards, marketing went out and HR went out today informing the college community that classes are gonna be canceled on that day. We do, of course, expect normal college operations to resume on April 9th. The Joan Bozer event on April 18th, there's some cards floating around that has more information on this. From my understanding, tickets are not live yet. They will be going out, I believe, what was it, Bob, later this week? By the end of the week. By the end of the week, thank you. So ticket information will be coming out by the end of the week. Um, we have a visit from the SUNY BOT chairwoman, Dr. Merrill Tisch, at City Campus on the 14th. She's going to be meeting with faculty and students Thursday morning. And then finally, I'd like to ask Dr. Quinn if she would recognize George DeRosa to speak and give us an update on the United Way campaign. Okay, yep, thank you. George? Thank you very much. Good. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as many of you know, uh, I work in the HR department here at ECC, but I've also been running the ECC United Way campaign for the last 14 years. Um, the campaign has grown over the years, but unfortunately, starting in 2020 with COVID, numerous retirements and uh, layoffs, the campaign has suffered greatly over those last four years with the attrition of a employees for the last four years here at the college. I made the decision to keep the campaign going at a minimal level and did not feel it was appropriate to ask more from everybody with all the situations happening during those challenging times. This year, I decided it was the time to rejuvenate the campaign for 2023. Uh, you may have received emails from me which start in September and go through early March, which is generally the campaign season for United Way every year. I will say it was a great comeback for 2023. To all ECC employees, you have shown the community your generosity and compassion in the 2023 campaign by raising over $10,000. And I wanna thank you all for those contributions. As a small token of my appreciation, please feel free to stop by. Uh, my office is in G Building, room 132. I'm gonna have bagels and Timbits this Friday. Um, I'll, also have, <laughs> I'll also have some you know, coffee, tea, snacks, which are normally always available to anyone, anytime, for employees and students uh, for free. Um, I want to just say also, when you think of the ECC United Way campaign, please remember this. Each of us has something to share, be it a dollar, an hour, a voice. When we give, we create a community where every child finds joy in learning, every family has a place to call home, and every person has hope. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, George. And thank you, ECC community and faculty and staff for contributing. That's, um, that's tremendous, $10,000. Thank you. And you're in G Building? <laughs> yeah, G132. G132. I'm the open door. You'll see it. Yeah. So anytime, Friday or any other time, you're more than welcome. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thank you, George. All right, so with that, we're gonna move on to the approval of the minutes from our February 2024 meeting. Um, can I have a motion to approve those minutes? Aaron, a second. Tom, thank you. Uh, any discussion? Any objections? Okay, we're gonna pass those minutes by consent. 
Moving on to old business, uh, Michael Rio with governance. So we've received nominations for open positions. And as you can see, we still have a number of vacant positions. So at this point in the election process, we're really looking for uh, people to um, volunteer or share that there are vacancies for these seats on the Senate and get them filled by appointment. Uh, there are no elections scheduled for College Day. The nominations that we did re receive for those seats that are um, uh, not requiring election, so there won't, won't be an election in March. That's our update from governance. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Michael. And so with, um, you can see there's uh, many vacant positions here. Maybe you were in a position and you are realizing, oh no, I forgot to nominate myself or I didn't realize there was a position open for my area, I would have talked to somebody or nominated somebody, anything along those lines. So with vacancies, we can do a one year um, appointment um, through College Senate Executive Committee. So with these, and I will send them out in my email later uh, this week as well. If you are interested in serving as a one year appointment to the College Senate for any of these areas, um, please email me and we can appoint you at the next College Senate um, Executive Committee. And also, uh, the way appointments work, you don't necessarily have to be from that area, okay? So, um, let's say, I don't know, there's, uh, there's almost every area is there, but let's say five liberal arts people sit, come forward and say they are interested in an appointment. Um, and there's only two spots, right? But nobody else from technologies comes forward. So we can slot people in for those areas, if you know what I mean. Um, you also do not necessarily have to be teaching faculty to be um, a one-year appointment. I remember Jason Perry at one point um, did a one-year appointment as well and uh, served for a group. So um, lots of different uh, possibilities there. So if you are interested in serving on College Senate, even if you aren't specifically to one of these areas, it's a one-year commitment um, to have the appointment and um, you can come and hang out with us and see what we're all about, okay? Thank you, Michael. Okay, hey, uh, middle state, middle states. Oh my goodness, middle states uh, strategic plan. Uh, Kathy isn't here, so there is. Uh, we're going to go past that and move on to strategic enrollment management. Dr. Erickson Neelans. We have spring enrollment, open house, all sorts of things coming up. Great, thank you. I'll add to this as well. Our end of term uh, enrollment data for fall of 2023 was released uh, from SUNY. So these are our official numbers. Um, I want to thank everyone, uh, especially over the summer, our marketing team, admissions team, uh, for the work that they did. Our first time student category was up 5% in terms of credit hours um, compared to the prior fall. Um, thanks to Cheryl and her commitment to the advanced studies group, along with all of our lead teachers, uh, we saw an increase of 5% in our advanced studies group. Um, we saw that again here for spring of 2024. Now is a great opportunity, and I appreciate Dave Uzinski and others um, who've reached out to our admissions team or others to figure out how we can help matriculate those students into the institution next year. Um, this is a remarkable opportunity that all of our faculty have to work with the teacher uh, at the high school as well as those students to really help bring them into um, our funnel in our institution. I, I know I say this, I think each meeting, um, our greatest opportunity lies as we're working with students um, in the classroom, outside the classroom, uh, to keep them here. Our continuing student category was down 7% in terms of credit hours last uh, fall of 23 compared to the prior year. Uh, that trend is continuing here in spring of 24 compared to last year as well. I know with the work from the leadership team and our Title III grants and what we're doing to help students uh, with advisements in the classroom, um, that's really, I think, our greatest opportunity as we look at uh, the enrollment reality we're in. Summer of 2024 has started our registration. Um, it is down, but it is increasing um, in terms of the pace uh, over the last week or so. Uh, so I'll have better numbers as we get closer uh, to the start of that uh, session. 
Switching over to our open house, exciting opportunity here in uh, middle of April, so April 16th uh, at City Campus, April 17th at South Campus, and April 18th at North Campus. Uh, all three of those are gonna be from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. Uh, we've had a significant number of individuals already register for those. Uh, you'll see increased, well, you may not see, but there's increased marketing uh, that is gonna be scheduled to start uh, middle of uh, March uh, and then run until April 18th. So uh, be on the lookout for those if you do see those. And then lastly, we do have, um, continuing with what we did last year, um, big thanks to, again, the, the faculty and others who've uh, helped with this idea. We do have our uh, new student registration day that is scheduled for May 1st uh, from 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, this is a great opportunity for incoming students to register. Um, it's also a great opportunity that students that you have uh, that you're working with uh, that are already here on campus, uh, if that's the time that works for them uh, to be able to register, um, it's a good opportunity too. But this is really a nice opportunity like we did last year uh, to be able to help our incoming students to get registered before their academic year ends. Great. Does anybody have any questions for Erickson? All right. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the Academic Assessment Committee, Dr. Sabrina Kane. The committee is finally starting to get some uh, assessment materials that we're looking at with our new process and actually one of the things we discovered is that we maybe we're considering changing the process again now those of you who have been doing the program review this year or the unit review rather this year um, have been using a new system that has been instituted through Brightspace and this is the first year we're using it so we have to see how it works but it it just seems to me to be such an easy transparent way to do things that faculty are familiar familiar with that the AAC had a discussion about maybe we want to change over learning outcomes to doing a similar kind of a process but for the time being we're just going to continue using the form which I think is easier than Nuventive so we're continuing to refine the assessment process to make it easier and better for everyone and then we had an item of business is that we have um, a librarian who wants to sit on our committee, Barrett Gordon, so we need the Senate to confirm the motion for him to sit on the committee. Great, thank you. Sabrina, would you like to make a motion to confirm membership of librarian Barrett Gordon to the committee? I would. Second. Aaron, thank you. Uh, any discussion? Any objections? All right, so that is um, gonna pass by consent and uh, Barrett is now part of the, the committee. Great, thank you. Um, any questions for Sabrina with academic assessment? All right, moving right along. Uh, seven and a half week courses, Dave Uzinski. Hi everyone. So some important dates for this week. Um, Thursday, 314 is run cancel. So we have a few classes that are a little bit low enrolled. So I'll go over those in just a second. Friday, the first half semester courses end. Monday, the second half, some more, uh, half semester courses begin, um, and that's also the only day of add drop for those courses. Um, the courses that are kind of low enrolled at the moment that maybe we can salvage, I don't know if you can talk to your students tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're up against the, the time limit here, is a couple English classes, English 101 and English 102. So remember, a student can enroll in one of those courses, let's say they're in EN 101 and things aren't going well, they can withdraw from the 101 and they can take the 102 as long as their major allows for it or vice versa. But they can't re-enroll in the same class in the same semester, just a reminder. Um, if you do have students that are interested, have them reach out to the Dean of Students. We've been sending them to the DOS at ecc.edu email address. I can't help but think that's Microsoft DOS, but I know it's <laughs> Dean of Students. Um, I'm kind of dating myself, I guess, with that reference. Um, there are 14 closed sections, which is amazing, like how many sections are already full. There are still 12 sections that have seats available. So there, are, there is still some room, although it's, a, it's pretty packed, so, which is good news. So does anyone have any questions? Um, I guess the evening classes is up there too. So um, we're still trying to determine like what would work well in terms of like an evening program with seven and a half week courses at uh, 
uh, like North and City. I don't know how much, and South has had some uh, business classes that were half, half semester courses. Um, we're still working on that. Hopefully we can get some plan together where maybe that becomes the better avenue for students wanting to have like an accelerated type program or just focus on maybe one or two classes at a time and be able to finish two to four classes in a semester and that type. But I don't have any major updates on that yet. Great, thank you, Dave. And then for drop add, um, it's one day? Just like summer. Just like summer, Adrian, can you confirm? All right, what day is it? Just the Monday the classes begin. Oh, so this coming, the Correct. 18th? Correct, so the, the classes begin this Monday, the 18th. Hmm. So they have one day to look at the syllabus and determine whether or not they want to stay. Whew, all right. <laughs> That's fast, all right, so. <laughs> um, Paul Danu is uh, not here for a facilities report, so. Uh, so we're gonna skip that. Uh, and uh, Jackie Bossman is here to give us an update for the Chancellor's Award. Hi everyone. Okay, so we have successfully uh, submitted six nominations for awards this season, and now we wait to hear from SUNY. And Great. that's the update, yeah. And um, just to reiterate what we had said last month, uh, nominations are ongoing just because they were due for the spring semester, like, you know, by January or whatever. That doesn't mean that you can't still continue thinking about who you would like to nominate for Chancellor's Awards. Um, you know, getting the packet and things together is um, actually quite cumbersome. You have to get letters and all these things. So if uh, you know someone that you wanted to nominate, but you didn't have time to get it together or whatever, um, there is time to do that for the next round. Because this isn't just, you know, willy-nilly once or twice a decade. This is annual. So, um, you know, keep that in mind for future uh, awards. Thank you, Jackie. Um, Title III grant and, oh, I skipped something, sorry. Academic Standards Committee, Amy Yoder. Um, Academic Standards Executive Committee, um, actually, let me go back. We had the Policy Committee of the BOT and the Academic Forgiveness Policy that was approved by this body was also approved by the BOT. Um, there was some discussion about procedures, which the subcommittee of academic standards who's been working on that will continue to meet and make some changes based on new data that was made aware to us today. Um, I'll, if, if it's okay, I'll go out of order and give it to Sabrina at the end. We are still looking for um, faculty and staff to work on uh, another subcommittee, which is to write out and articulate what our NA procedures really truly are each semester. So if you're interested in joining this exciting committee, please reach out to myself or Colleen Quinn. I will pass it over to Sabrina Kane, who is chairing our Academic Integrity Subcommittee. So we had a really productive meeting this month. We've decided that the question of the policy, we are going to defer to the fall because it takes quite a while to be able to pass a policy revision through all the proper channels to have it finally be ratified. And we wouldn't be able to get it in this year's catalog anyways. But we did decide that we did want to revise the policy language because there were some words in there, like I think collusion. And we were wondering you know, how you would define that and if students understood that. So we are going to be looking at the policy language in the fall. We switched our attention over to the procedures. And we discussed having a form that would be housed with the dean of students for faculty to be able to report um, academic dishonesty so that we could keep track of serial offenders. So that's something that we'll be working on and, and uh, in implementing in the future. And then most of our work for that particular meeting was done on trying to craft a set of uh, recommendations or best practices for faculty if they discover academic dishonesty, what they can do, what they might want to do, what their options are, um, and how to best handle the situation. Great, thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions uh, regarding the work of Academic Standards Committee? Okay, so I just also wanna remind everyone that um, 
with academic standards and any other college senate committee um, you know the membership is in the college senate bylaws and we did all vote as a group to the membership and just like we did today to confirm barrett who is on these committees right so if you represent an area and you are on these committees it is your duty as a member of the committee to not only attend the meetings but also to report back to your area um, so simply sitting on the meeting and not reporting back or discussing it with your unit or your area you're really not doing a good service to the college and the work of the committee if it's just going in one ear and out the other and then we're sitting at college senate and you're like well i didn't know about this we're like well we, we, we had nine meetings about it what do you mean you don't know about it right and if you feel like your area is not you're not getting the information from these meetings to your area you can say hey is my area represented on that committee and i will say yes uh you know or no whatever and maybe then we have to reevaluate the membership of the committee right or yes so and so is supposed to be representing that area oh i see they're not attending maybe we can have someone else attend in that person's stead all right so uh the crux of shared governance is uh transparency right and inclusivity and the only way it works is if we all maintain that together as a group and if you take the information and actually bring it back to the area so we can have these productive back and forths and not then do all this work in committees and then come up to the Senate and be like, well, I didn't know about that even though you were in attendance of said meetings, right? So if you feel like you're not getting information, look and see if it's posted on Senate or shoot me an email and I will send it to you because I have um, a fantastic memory and I can pull things out uh, with specific dates uh, quite easily and I can provide that for you if you have questions, okay? Uh, thank you, Amy, for that update. Uh, Title III grant and transformation grant, ASAP. I know Kathy's not here, but Crystal is here from the grants office. Do you have anything you want to add for that? Sure. Okay. So um, I'll just give updates from um, the last report. Goal one, uh, we, have, we have two goals. Um, goal one is to increase student success. And um, we're going to do that in English and math. It's increased student success in Gatekeeper EN 100, 101, and 102 for students identified as requiring developmental education. Uh, the seating capacity in identified Gatekeeper courses uh, reduced effective with the spring 2024 academic term for math and English. Um, tutoring services are moved out of student affairs and into academic affairs um, where it made sense. Um, improve student success in, um, oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, seating, uh, co-requisite seat time incorporated into the four identified gatekeeper courses effective with spring 2024 academic term. Um, uh, objective two is English and primary faculty advisor distribution of no more than 30 advisees. And we're going to realign academic advising in academic affairs, hire additional academic counselors, and assign all academic counselors to an academic division, and then move general studies ISS advisors from student affairs into academic affairs and ASAP uh, general studies. Um, objectives 2D and 2E are reorganized staffing to align with two student success coaches for each division and then establish alignment and professional mentor programs, which are all um, upcoming. And then goal two, um, there is an online orientation now. Um, there's created, they created videos for two students on February 20th. Um, Dr. Sagai has a welcome message that was created and um, IT was reviewing and editing the videos, um, and I, I think those were reviewed and edited. And then there's in-person planning events, um, in-person events for um, fall 24, August 20th, August 21st, and August 22nd. The 20th is at South, the 21st is at North, and the 22nd is at City, all from uh, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. And then um, the second update for 
grants would be our ASAP, which is the transformation fund. And then as of today, there were um, 40 st 47 students officially attached to the ASAP. Um, there's, we're expected to get 50. Tracking of these students um, is going through the registrar's office and um, faculty progress updates. There was a student-focused interactive event at the end of February. Um, preparations for fall are open house, increasing marketing, creating more signage for the program, uh, website enhancements, and eligible students um, are given information with the benefits of the program. Great, thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Crystal? Um, can you just tell me, oh, Jackie, go ahead. Uh, excuse me if I missed this in earlier conversation anywhere, but what exactly is a student success coach? Can you answer in the mic? The job description for that hasn't been written yet, so that's still we're discussing. I can tell you that we've used um, student success and uh, peer coaches with other grants, and it's, it's similar to a mentor, um, along with some other things, but yeah, the, the job description is not, um, it's in progress. Thank you. Jackie? Uh, once the job description is written, uh, it is it possible that faculty from that division could maybe meet with them or something like that? Also, sorry about, I'm never gonna sit in this row again. I feel like I have to ask facing this way and then. <laughs> Once the job description has been established, um, will there be any sort of participation or input from faculty from that division about student success and uh, if someone is brought on, uh, is there a plan for them to meet with faculty? These might be questions that, you know, are just really far off from being capable of being answered. I'm just curious about the whole idea of it. Adrian? Yes, those things would have to be decided. I don't see any reason why that wouldn't be a possibility at this point. But again, some of the questions that you asked, as you stated, were kind of in the future and, and for future consideration right now. We haven't even gotten to the point where we've written the job description so we know what the duties of this position are going to entail. So once we get to that point, then we'll, I'll be better equipped to answer that question more fully. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. And then, Crystal, you mentioned some dates. I just want to re reiterate those. The 20th, 21st, and 22nd of April are, what are they? August. Of August. Okay, what are those for? Orientation. 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 Sorry. Yeah. They are, yes, August 20th is at South, August 21st is at North, August 22nd is at City, and they are all from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. 2 p.m. And they're in person. It was, uh, well, it's called Welcome Events. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. Any other quest, uh, questions for uh, Crystal? All right. Great. Thank you very much. Um, General Education Committee, Andy Heisey. Hello, everybody. Um, <clears throat> just as a quick refresher, we've got one of the most generic names in the entire college. So uh, the General Education Committee is basically the steward of uh, institutional learning outcomes, SUNY general education requirements, coursework related to those things. And it's, of course, my distinct pleasure to be the one to email all of you to say, <laughs> it's time to assess. Um, so yeah, you've gotten those emails from me, I'm sure. Anyway, um, with those things, uh, one of the things that we're constantly doing is examining and re-examining our ILOs. Uh, you know, sometimes those things get tweaked a little bit here and there and maybe even changed more than that if we decide that we need to do so to make sure that they're still relevant to the college community. Um, as such, we're taking a look at the technological competence ILO right now, which we're gonna assess for next year. After that, though, really, uh, the one thing that has given the committee the most business over all of the time that I've chaired it, and even some before that, uh, we have the SUNY DEISJ, or Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Social Justice Knowledge and Skills Area. Um, we, like most of SUNY, had absolutely no way of being ready for that when it dropped. Um, it's not like anyone's got you know, an entire discipline area called diversity, right? Anyway. 
The fact that we used to have an entire committee and a plan devoted to that, that's the Erie Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Plan that's on the agenda, is the reason that there's been a resolution that I drafted, including with the March meeting informational documents, that we could use, uh, should the Senate decide to, to reconstitute that committee and effectively have uh, a body that's capable of steering the entire college when it comes to matters of diversity, equity, and inclusion. There is another reason, though, that this committee is necessary, especially now. Like I said, um, you know, there's, there's no department in the college called the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Department, which means that we've got this consideration of new courses for the DEI, SJ subject area and skills, or pardon me, uh, subject and skills area, that there's literally no one at the college to consider. It's fallen to the Gen Ed Committee simply because that's what we're already doing. And so the other reason that I personally, but I think all of the committee as well, and frankly lots of the college community, would like to see this committee reconstituted is so that we have a body of people from all across the college who isn't just offering guidance on these new courses, though we'd honestly appreciate it. Um, they can also offer up additional guidance or other opinions on things that have to do with diversity. We have to believe that if SUNY has decided to make it not just part of the new SUNY general education framework, but one of the four required areas, they're taking it quite seriously. So we've got to make sure that we get considerations uh, that are relevant to it as, as right and as carefully considered as we can. Great, thank you, Andy. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, um, um, we've had the resolution to form a Senate Diversity Committee uh, posted for over a week. It's been up there. Um, Andy is a non-voting liaison. As such, Andy, would you like to make a motion to approve the, this resolution? Uh, if I'm able to, yes, I make the motion. All right, uh, second, Amy. Um, and let's uh, discuss it. So Andy introduced it um, and pretty much went over all the different whereas. I know membership is always um, something that everyone's interested in. So membership will include one representative of the Equity and Diversity Office, one representative of IRAP, one representative of Student Access Center, College-Wide Curriculum Committee, Gen Ed Committee, three faculty representations, uh, representatives, ooh, uh, one rep of Human Resources, one representative of Admissions, one counselor, the dean of students, one academic dean. And then of course, ex officio members, um, which consists of the college president, office of the provost, et cetera. Amy? I'd like to suggest a friendly amendment. There's two deans of students. Ah. So do we wanna specify both deans of students on this um, committee or just say, or change it to just one dean of students? committee chair would like. Andy? I'm fine with it either way. Um, the goal was to make sure that a dean of students is represented. If there are two, I don't see a reason it has to be both of them. Okay, so maybe um, we'll say one dean of students. I'll change the language to say one. All right, so we have a amendment on the floor. Um, so before we can vote on this, we need to vote to change the wording where it will say, instead of the dean of students, it will say one dean of students. Um, Amy made that motion. Who would like to second it? Amy, uh, any questions, comments, objections? All right, so the motion passes by consent. So I'll change that now. All right, Tahira. I'd also like to um, make a motion to amend it to add a librarian to the committee as well. All right, uh, anyone want to second that motion? Amy, uh, discussion, questions, objections? 
Motion passes by consent. Thank you. I'll put it. How am I doing with my type in? Am I doing all right? All right. Just make sure I'm not. I do numbers. Just saying. Uh, all right. So, other. Um, other items regarding membership? And so um, under the rest of the resolves, the Senate Diversity Committee will report its activities to the Senate during Senate meetings. So it will become a regular uh, reporting structure, um, very similar to uh, curriculum college-wide curriculum committee, academic standards. There might not be, or general education, there may not be monthly updates, but as uh, the group does different work, it'll be uh, updated at Senate. Other questions or comments on this resolution? Any objections? Okay, so this resolution passes by consent with the two friendly amendments uh, added to the membership. Great, thank you, Andy. And then I also saw that we have another um, course that was approved for uh, a diversity. Yes, we do. Uh, this is CA 205. Um, oh boy, and of course now I'm blanking. Uh, I believe this is interpersonal communication. Interpersonal Amber, do you wanna talk about it really quick since we're gonna be advising students for fall? Uh, yes, please add them to the class. Uh, so yes, CA205 Interpersonal Communication is a communication course. I'm actually the instructor of that class. Uh, and it basically deals with very ground level communication, but borrows very, very heavily from psychology and sociology. At its core, it's a class about how communication helps you create your identity. So it deals with everything how through communication we learn and then later express what our thoughts, our views, our beliefs, our value systems are, what our view of the world is, uh, and then most importantly, how we fit into that world. Um, we deal with very base level things like listening skills, conflict resolution, verbal and nonverbal communication to some of the really, really deep stuff like perception, self-concept, identity, uh, and this whole, you know, the entire class fits so cleanly into this category because there's no lecture in it, there's no lesson in it that isn't touched by culture and diversity and inclusion. And although it is a required class for all communication majors, it is specifically written and designed to fit into any curriculum. Um, it is actually a recommended elective for dental students, so we get a lot of nursing, science, dental students in it, uh, but it's also a very, very popular elective for general study students because of just how broad it is. Um, so it's, it's a really good class that fits into a lot of curriculum. Right now it's only offered in person at South Campus, but we do have online sections for the fall and then for summer session as well. Great, thank you. Any uh, questions on the new class, uh, general education, the new diversity committee? All right, great. So if you are interested in serving on the new College Senate uh, Diversity Committee, please send me an email um, and I'll get all the names and things together. I will also try to reach out to individual constituent groups to make sure that your area is represented. Um, and again, this is a, a, one of those committees. If you are uh, appointed or choose to serve on it, you are also taking on the responsibility of communicating that information back to your area and then bringing information back and forth because that's how you know all this good stuff works, right? Uh, maybe we should all take that communication class, right? So we can figure that out. All right, uh, thank you very much. And uh, we're moving on to new business. Um, Dr. Miriam Parti is not here. Um, but college day is March 22nd. Um, I know there's going to be some stuff about Brightspace. If you're STEM, it's going to be me. Uh, super fun. Um, I don't know. I think, I don't know who else is doing. That's all I know because there isn't an agenda yet. I don't see our talent management uh, person from HR who's, I believe, in charge. I don't know. Is there, I don't know, there's, it's in 10 days. Is there an agenda? Any, 
Anything? Cool. Uh, well, I think I, mine's at 1240, I think. I think. Is it, Pat? I, I forget. You'll see the agenda when you see the agenda. I, I was given a slot. I can't promise you. 1245 right. to 120 is what I thought I heard. There we go. Yeah, that's because uh, I, I also serve on uh, the college-wide distance learning uh, committee as the faculty chair. Um, so Pat reached out to the other faculty to be part of that portion. So we do know that 1245 to 120 will be uh, bright space um, by division. So well, hopefully we'll have an agenda for that soon. Uh, graduation, I already talked about it. There's a form. Uh, Artificial Intelligence Task Force Faculty Caucus of the Senate. I'm going to turn it over to Aaron Thomas. All right. I don't have a whole heck of a lot to report um, other than that, um, as you can see in front of you, we still have some um, vacant spots. So we need some representation from health sciences, obviously one from STEM um, and one business public service. Colleen, I'm looking at you. Um, and then a student representative. Um, so if anybody has any ideas of a student who is kind of plugged into AI or um, anything you know, adjacent, please, please, please send that student my way. Um, I'd like to try to get the ball rolling on this sooner than later. Um, and I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, like once we have a chairperson, we can kind of vote to get this going. Yep. Um, yep. And so Aaron, would you like to make a motion to um, uh, confirm the membership of the task force? I would indeed. All right. Anyone second that? Alyssa, thank you. And any questions or comments? Any objections? So, no, seriously, no questions. I'm, <laughs> I'm fine with that. I was just, I was, I was so prepared. Okay. Jackie? Never mind, Jackie. Never mind. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry to do this. Um, do you, uh, maybe I didn't see it. Do you have an idea of when you'll meet? Um, so, glad that you would ask. I would like to meet, room to be determined, um, on college day. That would, <laughs> um, and I really, honestly, um, feel free to attend um, if you'd like. You know, just a, if you want more information on, you know, um, what we are doing in, in you know, I'm, I'm open to feedback in that realm as well. But um, I would like to meet on college day just to kind of get the ball rolling, so to speak. You're welcome. Great. Thank you. All right, so with uh, no objections on the task force membership, uh, we will uh, accept this and confirm the membership. And again, there are one, two, three, four, five vacant spots. If you, again, see on there, hey, my area is missing people, and you think that you would fit that, or you know someone in your department that would fit that, please let us know. Uh, and hopefully college day, uh, room and time TBD, right along with that agenda. All right. Uh, is Laura Tesh here? She could not be here. Dr. Quinn, I can give a quick update on that chart. Do you have the chart? I sure I do. I understand you have the chart. Yep. So it's just, this is a high level um, chart that's gonna go out to students and also be posted on the websites. And Dr. Quinn, from what I was told, the information you have has been updated to include office locations. Okay. So I believe you do, yeah. So it's just a very high level uh, for students. It'll be sent out to students and staff um, where students should go if they have academic issues, obviously student non-academic issues, campus safety, and then uh, sexual harassment and discrimination. Okay, and you said a committee um, developed this? It was a, yeah, I would say ad hoc, and it consisted of Adrian, myself, Laura Tesh, Nikki Howard, Mark Pacholik, Laura Tesh, that, that, that's it. All right, no faculty or deans of students? No. Gotcha, okay. Um, so, Laura and I had a, a little bit, we talked a little bit about this, um, and there's something I want to bring up. So, it does say on there, for resolutions to academic complaints, please contact the appropriate dean of academics. That is actually incorrect. Uh, 
That is not the correct procedure of the college. Um, if a student has an academic complaint, uh, what they need to do is talk to their instructor first. We should not be running to deans first. Uh, if it is not resolved with the instructor, it then goes to the department chair and it gets handled on the departmental level. If it then does not get resolved at the department level, then and only then do we involve the academic deans. All right, um, and this is something that we have gone over multiple times, uh, almost every semester, um, with uh, this type of um, situation. Um, I did ask to have the workflow chart um, updated to reflect the proper procedure, um, and I was assured that um, uh, Colleen Reedy and Adrian Rannick will instruct their deans to what the appropriate procedure is and to make sure that the procedure is followed for any complaints that come straight to academic deans to make sure we go through the process. Adrian? That is the intent. It's not to have the academic deans handle the problems on face value. It's to go through the process with the student and explain to them what the proper steps are. So it, it, I understand where you're coming from. It seems a little bit misleading, but the intent here is to have the academic deans go over the process with the students to resolve their complaint. Okay, Aaron? Is that once they have gone to the faculty member and once that they have gone to the chair, to Adrian? Not necessarily, again, it's not to have the deans resolve the issue, it's to have the deans explain the process to the student. So one of the questions would obviously be, if the process says, have you spoken to your faculty member first, and the answer to that is no, they would have to explain to the student that the first step in the process is to go speak to their faculty member. Yes. Thank Amber? You. Wouldn't that make more sense just to leave that in the chart then? Because that feels like a very convoluted process and if I were a student I would be very confused who I'm supposed to speak to about an issue and especially if it's a small issue like a grade, looking at the flow chart and saying I need to go right to the dean would be very one, intimidating and then as a chairperson I feel it also minimizes the role of a chairperson. Thank you. Amy? Uh, previously, I believe these were sent to counselors uh, to advocate on students' behalves and to uh, make them aware of the appropriate process. Um, I just was wondering why that had changed. I just got this uh, last week. On Friday. Even though Senate docs, we had a resolution, I think, that Bob Germoni brought forward a couple months ago about getting things two weeks ahead of Senate. Jackie? Uh, could we meet, a, could maybe the committee meet again and include some faculty representation and representation from counselors to communicate about this if it's going out to students? I think that's a fair idea. I'm wondering um, how this is gonna be disseminated to students as well. And is there a plan to share this outside of College Senate to faculty and staff or in the counseling unit for people that, you know, work with students one-on-one -on -one with uh, any sort of disputes? Is there a plan for any of that? My understanding is that it was going to be put in the, the SharePoint and also uh, college-wide emails will be going out. In the college-wide emails, will it be... Um, the correct process spelled out as well, or I, just this flow chart? I can't comment on an email that hasn't been written yet. Can we make the recommendation that the process of talking to your faculty member and then the department chair should be done before going to the academic deans? Of course. Other questions or comments about this document? Andy? It seems like it would be pretty easy to make sure that there's a link to this sort of thing on Brightspace. Um, I don't know that we can dictate that everybody does that necessarily, but it would be a good idea. Other uh, questions or comments about this flowchart? 
Joel? Now he's got to stand up and go to the mic. Sat in the back. Is this on? Okay, it's on. Is it? No? It's on. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. <laughs> so I'm not sure if this is just for like, if a student's having academic problems, but if you're calling it a resource chart, there's no um, IT support on there or distance learning support. So we may want to add the help desk to that or the service desk for both. Right, that's a good point. Was IT represented on that committee? No. Mm. Right, because if students have a DL problem or any sort of login problem, directing them to IT and the help desk would be useful information on this flowchart. Amber? I'm sorry, one more question. Why was this done separate from the Academic Standards Committee? Because I believe we have an Academic Standards Committee who meets regularly, who deals with these issues. So why was this done outside of that committee? I don't know. That's a good question. Because I'm also noticing that student access isn't on here either. Um, I know Dan Frontera is not here right now, but that is also um, a helpful resource for students. Um, so we're missing several columns if this is going to be a tool. Amy? Uh, the Student Support Center should be referenced on there as well. Uh, yeah. If it's a resource, for sure, we provide support. Yeah, yeah. Tutoring Centers is another resource that should probably be represented. Bob? So I know why it's on there for office hours, but what are our plans if we're sending students to like the Dean of Students or something, where we're saying they're there Monday through Friday, eight to four, but I'm looking at two Dean of Students sitting over there where I know there's nobody in their office right now. We're sta <laughs> we are staff. You have to be recognized. Oh. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Colleen Reedy, would you like to respond? Thank you. We are working on staffing every day, each of the Dean of Students offices, but this, document was not is not meant to be an all-inclusive of everything so for example if a student has a non-academic issue and goes to a, a dean of students they will refer them to the proper offices amber i'm sorry one last issue with it being at south campus putting out a flowchart like this saying where if a student has an issue they need to go directly to a dean we don't have any Right. We have, we have a dean of students, sorry. We have no academic deans stationed at South Campus. So for academic issues, there would be nobody for them to go to. Right. Adrian? The academic deans are going to be splitting their time between City and North Campus and South Campus as well. So they will be staffed. They're not going to be staffed every day, but they are going to be staffed at multiple times throughout the week. Is that information going to be shared with faculty? Yes, it's on the updated flow chart. There was some modifications that I sent in that didn't make it to this flow chart, but yes. Oh. Amy? I guess my biggest concern is we spent many years trying to avoid bouncing students. There was the whole eerie bounce movement. Um, I feel like, unfortunately, this chart, with it being not broad enough, um, is going to create a lot of bounce and a lot of passing off of students and maybe students not following through with having their issues resolved because of it. So, um, you know, I think we really need to consider that as we move forward with this. That's a good point because one of our models is to be co good customer service and to provide good customer service. We don't want to be passing people around, phone calls get dropped, things like that, or maybe there's someone who isn't in an office because of whatever. Jackie Bossman. I'm sorry, I might have missed this. When is this going out to students and is there possibly a plan to adjust it before it does given our conversation here? Colleen, Adrian, you're both on the committee. I don't know the date of this going out and I will see about alterations to it. Great. Maybe we can make a recommendation to broaden that committee to discuss it a little bit further before it gets sent out to students.
Sabrina? Well, I don't know exactly what the reasoning behind doing this so top down is. Um, you know, besides the fact that approaching a dean could be intimidating to students, but it also seems to me, in all fairness, that deans are very busy people, and having them deal with student complaints, some that could be very easily resolved at a lower level, is kind of inefficient. And I'm, I'm actually looking at this, and this is this is just an idea I'm throwing out there, but could we have one single person or office who serves as like an ombudsman for complaints and then can easily direct the student to where they need to go instead of them having to figure it out by looking at a chart and figure out what level is appropriate? Amy? So the Student Support Center has been that for many years. Right, and that is a good overall group that if a student were to contact with a specific question can point the student in the correct direction and help that instead of bouncing them around. So I'm also noticing financial aid is missing, Bursar's office, like, but it's very pretty though. Uh, I like the shadows. Chris? Is there a specific lawsuit this is trying to avoid? Uh, always the conspiracy theorist. I love it. Thank you. Probably not. I'm going to go with. <laughs> Chris, would you like to comment? I didn't mean ongoing. I meant preventative. Like, is there a, an anti a previous case at a different uh, university or <laughs> a situation in which uh, suddenly this came out as the new float chart in terms of uh, order of operations for a student with a complaint? Gotcha. I understand. So what is the motivation behind um, this flow chart to create it? Anyone? The motivation? S supposed to simplify for students so they have a couple easy places to go to that will guide them to, if, they, if needed. Okay, thank you, Colleen. All right, so um, we've given our feedback and made the recommendation that before this is sent out to students that perhaps this um, small committee uh, diversifies itself a little bit to include um, some more areas of the college so that we can make sure we have something more comprehensive to uh, be more customer service friendly for our students and to prevent the eerie uh, bounce, right, which is something we do not like to be known for. Um, so uh, thank you everybody for your feedback with that. All right, so uh, with that, it's uh, time for the good of the order, which is the part of the meeting that we do off camera to do some problem solving and questions and things that are brought up in this portion of the meeting do get discussed in uh, at executive committee and sometimes they get pushed out to various committees uh, after this meeting, that kind of thing, and they eventually sometimes make it back um, to the agenda. So uh, the next College Senate meeting is, um, I usually write it down and I didn't today, it's the second week of April, right after we come back from spring break on the 9th, which is the day after the eclipse. Again, we are officially closed for the eclipse. There's been several emails and another one just went out from HR earlier today or maybe late yesterday about what to do time card wise. Um, so April 9th, We'll see everybody back with your, um, your, you'll all be glowing from being rested, right? Um, all right, so uh, at that, this point in time, we'll turn off the YouTube.